Life is filled with choices. Um, some of those choices are somewhat inconsequential, but a lot of those choices make a huge difference. They have consequences. Uh, the choices we make will determine um, how well life goes, will determine our health, will determine the success of our marriage often, will determine uh, how much money we actually have for retirement. You know, you spend all your money now. Well, when retirement comes, you go, oh, I don't have any money. Well, that's a reason for that. You spend it all. And, and the choices we make will determine how we are remembered after we die. But even more than that, the choices that we make in this life will determine where we end up when we die. This morning, what we're going to do is we're going to look at this last section here of um, Galatians. And in it, Paul describes the false teachers. And he, he talks about how a false teacher is characterized. And if you remember the story from here in Galatians, that there was a, a conflict in the church. That Paul had come and talk to these people about Christ and said, as Gentiles, you can come to Jesus. He has sacrificed his life for you. All you have to do is come, come to him humbly, and he will make you new. And then a group of Jewish leaders came in and said, wait a minute, that's not the whole story. You have to become Jewish first before you can really become a Christian. So you need to be circumcised. You need to go through all these washings, and they had all these laws. And so this created this angst in the church. What are we supposed to do? Is there stuff we're supposed to do first? And Paul comes in and says, no, no, that's a perversion of the gospel. So now Paul, at the very end of the letter, gives us an evaluation. He says, I think these are the motives of the false teachers. And what I want to show you today is that the difference between a true teacher and a false teacher has to do with the choices that we make. And I want to show you three choices today that I think all of us have to wrestle with that will determine whether or not we stand with him or whether we stand against him. But first, we've got verse 11. Notice what large letters I use as I write these closing words in my own handwriting. And we wonder, what is this about? Well, a lot of the time, what would happen in, in a letter was they would be dictated. And they would use a called an amenuenza, but it really means a secretary, somebody who could transcribe. So, so you could see Paul kind of pacing sometimes as he's, as he's telling this, uh, reading out what he wants to say to these people, and this guy's writing away. Now, the reason that you do that is that parchment is expensive. And so somebody who could write well and could write small, you get a lot more on a piece of parchment than you can if Paul was writing. Now, as far as the um, postscript here, it was common practice for the person who was doing the dictating to kind of sign their name, to write something in their own handwriting so that people would know that it is an authentic document. Kind of the same thing you do when you go to an attorney. You go to an attorney and say, hey, here's what I'd like to do with my will or whatever the case may be. The attorney writes all that stuff up. They hand it back to you and what they want you to do. They want you to sign it. Why? Because that verifies that what's in the will is your wish. And so that's really what this is. Paul is signing this to say, this letter really is from me. Now, as far as the large letters, it could just be that Paul didn't write as well as the secretary did. Some people suggest that Paul was developing an eye problem, and there's some evidence from Scripture that maybe Paul was having some problems with his eyes. Maybe he was getting cataracts or something, so he had to write big, otherwise he couldn't see what he was writing. Or he was writing... Sound like I'm going through puberty there, doesn't it? <coughs> or, or... Sorry. <laughs> I'm in one of those moods today, can you tell? Um, or Paul was, was writing with emphasis... He was writing in large letters to, kind of like when you, when you send an email, and some of you don't understand this, but when you send an email and it's all in capital letters, well, that's like you're shouting. That's, that's what that means. So if, if you're doing that, stop shouting at me, okay? Um, and, and so maybe that's what he's doing, is I'm writing in big letters because I really want to emphasize what's at the end of this. So that leads us to say, well, what, what is at the end of this? Now in verses 12 and 13, what he does is he talks about the motives of the false teachers. And listen to what he says. Those who are trying to force you to be circumcised want to look good to others. 
They don't want to be persecuted for teaching that the cross of Christ alone can save. And even those who advocate circumcision don't keep the whole law themselves. They only want you to be circumcised so they can boast about it and claim you as their disciples. Do you see that? They want to look good. They want to uh, please their friends. They want to fit in with the crowd. They want to avoid persecution. They want to take the easy road. And they want to be able to point to statistics and say, look at all the people that we've got in our group. Now that leads us to three choices that we have to make in our life. The first one is that we need to make a choice between biblical truth and popular culture. They want to look good to others. Tim Keller, uh, Pastor Tim Keller from New York, he, he writes this. Paul has already said that the preaching of the gospel is terribly offensive to the human heart. People find it insulting to be told that they are too weak and sinful to do anything to contribute to their salvation. The gospel is offensive to the liberal-minded people who charge the gospel with intolerance because it states that the only way to be saved is through the cross. The gospel is offensive to conservative-minded people because it states that without the cross, good people are in as much trouble as bad people. Ultimately, the gospel is offensive because the cross stands against all schemes of self-salvation. There's this part of us that wants to feel that we get to go to heaven because we deserve it. That we did something that other people did not, and therefore we have earned it. There's a little snob appeal. And you've probably met Christians who are like this. Well, if you could be a little bit more like me, then you too could go to heaven. That is not the gospel message. And people are offended by the true gospel message. Our culture says we need to be good enough to earn. Have you, have you heard people say that? Do you think you're going to heaven when you die? Oh, I, I hope I've lived a good enough life. That's what a lot of people are banking on. That I've done more good things than bad things. And, and you hear that in Islam. You know, the goal is, um, I, I, as long as I do more good things than bad things, then I get in. That's not biblical at all. The Bible says any sin, any sin, excludes us from heaven. Even the more acceptable sins that many of us commit. Gluttony. Gossip. Um, idolatry. We, we worship all kinds of idols, but they're acceptable idols. Some of the materialism that's a part of who we are are all sin, but they're acceptable sin. Our society said, okay, these are okay, but they're not in God's eyes. We are all in trouble, and that's the message of the gospel. Now, what happens in some churches is you say, well, at least we're not saying that people need to be circumcised anymore. You know, that's not something that we say, you can't be a Christian unless you're circumcised. But we have all kinds of rules. I, I start thinking, you know, what, what are some of the rules that I've heard in churches? Here's some of the things that people say. You can be a Christian as long as you get baptized, and you get baptized in the way that we want you to be baptized. Or as long as you walk an aisle. You've got to walk an aisle. If you're not really a believer unless you walked forward and testified of your faith. And you're not really a believer unless you said the particular prayer that needs to be prayed. You have to include certain things. You've got to put the magic words in there, otherwise you can't get in. You can't be a believer unless you're willing to give 10% of your income to the church. That's more of a prosperity gospel thing, but you get that. That God says if you give 10%, he will multiply that and give it back to you. You need to be a church member. Usually, you need to be a member of our church. Some say you need to speak in tongues. Others say you need to remain celibate. Others say you can't be a Christian unless you vote a particular a political party. There's a lot of that going on. You can't be a Christian unless you are this party. Or you can't be a Christian unless you hold a particular ver uh, view of this social issue or hot-button issue. The problem with all of these things, and some of them are good. Some of these things are good things and appropriate things, but they are not the gospel. The gospel is very simple. It says you and I are broken. We are a mess. We all need something to rescue us. There is nothing that we can do to undo what we have done in the past. 
We need somebody to come and rescue us, to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And that somebody is Jesus. And what we'll see as we start in the Gospel of Matthew is that Jesus was trying to show us that he came and was tested in every way that we are, but he was without sin, so that made him qualified to be able to take our place and pay for our sin. He lived a perfect life so that that perfection could be credited to our account. The message of the Gospel is, even though you've messed up, Jesus has come to save you. That God took it upon himself to provide a way for you and I to be made right with him. And what's necessary is not for you and I to, to do certain things to earn his favor. It's to relax in his arms. It's to come to him and go, oh, and give up having to earn anything. We can come and find forgiveness and new life, and that's the gospel message. That's good news. It is for me, and I assume that it's good news for you. So my hope is that you come to worship on a Sunday and you walk out of here and you say, oh, I feel good about church today. But I hope it's not because you feel like you've, you've bought God off for another week. You know, I went to church, now God, see you next week. I hope you come out of here feeling good because you are reminded that God loves you for some reason and has done what is necessary for you to be able to walk with him not just today, but throughout the week. That's our hope. That's the gospel message. We need to make a choice. Are we going to um, stand on the biblical truth that we are saved by grace alone? Are we going to bind to this culture and spend our life running on this treadmill trying to earn God's favor? Second choice. We need to choose between the superficial faith and genuine faith. Verse 13 again, and even those who advocate circumcision don't keep the whole law themselves. They're inconsistent. They, they, they proclaim that you ought to do certain things, but they don't do it. They only want you to be circumcised so they can boast about it and claim you as their disciples. The message, uh, which is a paraphrase of the scriptures, here's what it says. These people who are attempting to force the ways of circumcision on you have only one motive. They want an easy way to look good before others, lacking the courage to live by a faith that shares Christ's suffering and death. For these people, according to Paul, it was all about statistics. It was all about winning. It was all about success. As long as they could look good, as long as they could fill their, um, their coffers, as long as they could bring people into their uh, churches, if you will, they were good. I'm, I'm troubled um, by some of the things that are going on in our society today. You, I remember back when I went to seminary, before they had books, um, I went to seminary, and, and even there, after three years of graduate school, you come out saying, boy... If I hadn't been a Bible major in college, you don't get near enough Bible in seminary. And that's even worse today. Because you're taking classes on, on leadership and vision casting and, and discipleship and all this stuff are good things. But, but we need to be learning the Word of God. You go to a pastor's conference and they, they, you know, the speakers will be talking about you. You've got to cast your vision for your congregation. Please, I hope you don't care about my vision for this congregation. I hope what you're concerned about is God's vision for this congregation. That we got, you got to, you got to find your brand. You got to market your church. Really? Is that what we've come to? That we're out marketing the church now? Are we supposed to be testifying to who Jesus is? There's just some weird things going on that we are becoming people who are so concerned about drawing a crowd that we have maybe forgot that our job is not to draw a crowd. Our job is to make disciples. Jesus did not say, go into all the world and be successful. That's not what he said. Go into all the world and preach the gospel, making disciples and baptizing people in my name. That's the challenge. We have to make a decision. Um, are, are we going to be people who, who look for a deep faith 
who realize that there's not going to be a lot of people who want to buy into that. There's going to be a lot of people who would, would just as soon just coast along. Jesus, just don't ask me to do anything, God. I'll go to church. It'll, it'll soothe my conscience, and that's it. Just leave me alone. Or are we going to be people who say, all to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely give? Because he's the Lord. We know that where he's leading us is where we want to go, even though we may not understand where that is at this point. The third choice we need to make is between living for self and living for Christ. And, and we see this at the end of this. Listen to what Paul says, As for me, may I never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of that cross, my interest in this world has been crucified. And the world's interest in me has also died. It doesn't matter whether we've been circumcised or not. What counts is whether we have been transformed into a new creation. May God's peace and mercy be upon all who live by this principle. They are the new people of God. From now on, don't let anyone trouble me with these things, for I bear in my body the scars that show I belong to Jesus, dear brothers and sisters. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. We are people who have a tendency to buy into the world's philosophy. The world says very simply, you got to look out for number one. You got to take care of yourself. Jesus said, deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. Listen to some of the things that, that happen um, to us because we listen to the world. We define beauty by the definition of advertisers. We attribute peace and pe a person's value by the income they make. We rank people by how they measure up to the status quo. Lord, help the person who's different. We determine our values by majority opinion. Let's take a vote and find out what's true or what's not. We raise our children so that they will fit in and they will measure up instead of raising our children so that they will stand out in a corrupt world. We define what is important by what the culture says is most important. Paul says, if you understand the gospel, you realize that it doesn't matter what the world says anymore. We are living by an entirely different value system. And, and because of that, the world's values mean nothing. And the world really has no hold on us. We've been set free. Satan can tempt us all he wants, but we are new creatures in Christ. Listen again to... Um, what Eugene Peterson does with this text. He writes, For my part, I am going to boast about nothing but the cross of our Master, Jesus Christ. Because of that cross, I have been crucified in relation to the world, set free from the stifling atmosphere of pleasing others and fitting into this little the little patterns that they dictate. Can't you see the central issue in all this? It's not what you and I do, submit to circumcision, reject circumcision. It's what God is doing, and he is creating something totally new, a free life. All who walk by this standard are the true Israel of God, his chosen people, peace and mercy on them. Now, when he says the new chosen people of God, it really means the new Israel. And people say, what does that mean? Well, if we go back to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 2, Paul makes this argument, and this is what he says. He writes, you are not a true Jew just because you were born of Jewish parents or because you've gone through the ceremony of circumcision. A true Jew is one whose heart is right with God. And true circumcision is not merely obeying the letter of the law. Rather, it is a change of heart produced by God's Spirit. And a person with a changed heart seeks praise from God, not from people. Paul's argument was that, that for a long time the thought was that God's chosen people were people who were Jewish, nationally. But Paul says what God was really saying was the true Jew people, the true Jewish people, the true chosen people were those that have been chosen by God and who have come to him in faith and truth. And so he's saying, we are the new Israel. We are the new chosen people of God, and we should be living according to the privilege that is ours. Paul writes in Galatians 2.20, I have been, I, the I in me, has been crucified with Christ. 
It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. That's what happens when we come to Christ. That's the choice between living for ourselves and living for Christ. You see, the true follower has to make some choices. We must decide whether we're going to try to save ourselves or place our hope in Christ. Whether we're going to commit to Christ and live by his priorities or whether we're just going to pretend. Whether we're going to build our lives on the word of God or only give lip service to his word. Quote the verses that we can remember and just forget about the rest. We have to choose whether we're going to be popular or faithful. We're going to have to choose whether we're going to go all in with Christ or whether we're just going to wear the t-shirt. Imagine, if you will, two canoes that are right next to each other on a nice, uh, tranquil lake, and, and you get into the canoes and you put one foot in each canoe, and you're, you're good, you're balancing, you know, everything's great, and you're fine. That's the way many Christians, especially in America, live. We figure we can, we can have one, one foot in American culture, we can have one foot in the gospel, and we can kind of keep things balanced. But something's happened in our society. The culture's shifting. It's kind of like some, some guy in a speedboat comes rushing by and now creates this wake. And you see this wake coming at you, and you know you're in trouble. You're going to have to decide to be in one boat or the other or you're going to be in the lake, right? And you have to make a choice. Whether you're going to go in with the culture and go that direction, which the Bible calls the wide road that leads to destruction, or whether you're going to get into the, the I'm going to stand with Jesus boat and understand that that, that brings conflict. The wide road is, is the easy one. Everybody's going out. You'll be popular. You can, you can kind of go with the flow. You can be with, like everybody else. The narrow road is going to be one that people are going to scoff at and they're going to give you a hard time about because you're going to be going against the current. And, and you know, if you're paddling against the current, it's a lot more exhausting than if you're going with the current. We have to make a choice. We can no longer straddle the boat anymore in our society. We've got to choose where we're going to stand. Most people are going to choose to go with the culture because it's easier. It's more peaceful. The problem is that those who choose the wide road end up at a dead end. That goes nowhere. Those who choose the narrow road find eternal life. Those who choose the way of Christ are going to have to get really close to him. You're going to need courage. Because make no mistake, it's not an easy road. The Apostle Paul wrote Galatians because he saw the danger. He understood the choices that must be made. He didn't want the Galatians to trade the treasures of heaven for a bag of rocks. Even if they're nice looking rocks. But that's a choice that stands before us. Do we want the riches of heaven or the rocks of earth? I hope you will take the message of Galatians to heart. I pray that you will choose to stand with the one who died to set you free from sin and the life and the futility that goes with it. I pray that the Lord will be able to see in us and that the world will be able to see in us a life that can only come from Jesus. And then maybe, maybe, just maybe, they will choose to follow him too. Let's pray together. Father, make us aware of the choices that we're making every day. Some of them are so subtle that we don't even think about them. We just go with the flow. But in doing so, we're walking away from you. Give us courage, Father, to swim against the current, to paddle even though it's hard, to trust you enough to realize that the end that we're seeking is better than the end that the world can offer. Help us to make these choices, to be true followers and not just fans. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I suppose it's risky.